Okay, uh, welcome uh, to Magnets. Um, this seminar is uh, recorded and gonna be made publicly available on our YouTube channel. Continue participation in the seminar after recording begins. Constitute agreement for the recording to be available on YouTube. And uh, please keep your microphone muted and turn off your camera if you don't want to be seen or heard. Um, the Magnets team welcomes you. Uh, it's uh, it's gonna be uh, continuing, hopefully, uh, the seminar series. The format is usually is about 25 minutes of presentation, uh, followed by 15 minutes about of discussion. And there's gonna be time for catch up in the end that is not recorded. Um, so for today, I'm really happy to uh, introduce you, Eric Fon from University of Coimbra, Portugal. Um, Eric is gonna present a talk on magnetism of spellotems, advances and perspectives. So uh, please, Eric, take it up and share your screen. Thank you very much. Okay, it works? Yeah, we can see it well. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Eric. Okay, okay. So the Earth's magnetic field uh, varies in direction and intensity on the scale of 10 to 10,000 of years, which is called the secular radiation. And over geological times, the paleocycular variation is recorded by rocks. And igneous rocks uh, recall the Earth's magnetic field through uh, the acquisition of the thermal remanent magnetization. But this only provides a snapshot of the Earth's magnetic field. On the other hand, sedimentary rocks provide almost continuously record, uh, continuous time survey data, but suffer of a number of limitations, including diagenesis, remagnetization, and uh, inclination shallowing due to compaction. Purely researcher like Alfred uh, Latham uh, from the University of Liverpool um, investigate uh, the stalagmite, uh, the paleomagnetic record of stalagmite, with the aim of finding an alternative uh, continuous magnetic record. Indeed, uh, peleotem, stalagmite, are cave deposits that uh, grow uh, almost continuously and where magnetic particles inherited from the upper soils and bedrock are transported by drip water and deposited on the surface of the spelletum, acquiring a digital remanent magnetization. So this, this magnetization is no or, or, or little affected by post-depositional post -depositional processes and can be dated with uh, precision using radioisotopic series like uranium-thorium. So after the work of Flatham, a number of studies has been published in the 19. This is only some two, two examples. Um, from Morinaga in 1992, Openshaw 1997. Um, but uh, this stop in the end of in the end of the 19th, and we have to wait for uh, 2011 with uh, with a review paper by Jon Lasku and Feinberg to assist to a revival of the magnetism of, of spirit. Since and during the last decade, um, several authors report uh, unprecedented record of geomagnetic excursion in Spiritum. This is the case, for example, of the Blake geomagnetic excursion. Recorded in a radiometrically well-dated Spiritum from Spain by Ozet and colleague 2012. This is also the case for the Lasha excursion, um, dated with uh, precision by Lasky and Toleg in 2016 uh, at around 41,000 years. Uh, or another example of several geomagnetic excursions recorded in a stalagmite from Italy in the Laura Bune uh, magnetic chrome by Pozzi et al. 2019. Um, the magnetism of Spelerton can also provide precious information about climate and environmental change. And this is a case, for example, of the paper by Mark Boone and colleagues uh, from 2015, where the author show uh, a nice correlation between magnetite content, here illustrated by the flux of isothermal remanent magnetization, uh, with Climate proxy, um, this is oxygen and carbon isotope composition. 
Um, and here, the concentration in magnetite um, correlates with, with this climate proxy and may inform about variation in paleo precipitation. This is another example from a speleothem from uh, the Pau Dario cave in, in Brazil by Plinio, Jaqueto, and colleagues in 2016, where also the author showed nice correlation between. Um, concentration uh, concentration um, dependent magnetic uh, proxies with uh, oxygen and carbon composition. The author um, interpret this correlation and, and the concentration and the variation in the concentration of magnetite uh, controlled by soil, soil erosion and vegetation cover. More recently, uh, Yuval Burstein and colleague studied the stalagmite from uh, the Sora cave in Israel and also show a striking correlation between uh, magnetite content and um, carbon isotope composition. And uh, the author interprets this, this uh, variation in magnetite content as a result of variation of rainfall and, and soil erosion. And thanks to recent technological advances, um, like scanning squid microscopy, he uh, developed and applied by the research team of the MIT, including Benjamin Weiss and Eduardo Lima, uh, we, it is now possible to study the magnetization of very fine calcite lamina at the scale of uh, 150, 150 micrometers. Um, this is an example uh, of a paper by Josh Feldberg, um, who isolates several uh, uh, magnetically enhanced layers um, using scan, uh, scanning, scanning screen microscopy. And based on, on precise UTH dating, uh, the author was able to reconstruct paleo fluid events and discuss the implication in terms of uh, historical land use in Minnesota. Another technique is the quantum diamond microscope, uh, which provides um, mapping of the magnetic fields at a micrometer, micrometer scale. This is a paper by Roger Fu. Uh, we investigate the power value uh, stalagmite and uh, the relation or correlation between um, magnetic property and uh, climate climate proxy uh, at a really really fine scale. So these are only some examples, uh, um, but the number of paper about magnetism of osperiotin published in the last decade testify of the strong potential of, of speleothem in providing outstanding data um, for paleoclimate and earth magnetic field reconstruction. So this, this sounds like we are living in a, in a wonderland where everything is perfect and works very well, but, but this is not actually always the case. And there are indeed some problems. Problem number one is whether speleothem can experience the positional inclination error. Um, Pioneer study suggests that there are no significant difference between the acquisition of remnants in the central or lateral area of stalagmite. <coughs> However, a recent paper by Georges Pont and colleagues who study uh, stalagmite from Algarve, south of Portugal, demonstrate convincingly that uh, the positional inclination error may actually occur. <clears throat> so after dating the stalagmite using uh, UTH and uh, C4 teams, um, we compare the magnetic direction measured in several lines and columns with a uh, paleosecular variation model, here is a Shadiff model, and we can see that the steeper the calcite layer R, the lower the magnetic inclination is. So this suggests that indeed um, some inclination error may actually happen. And you can see also this here when looking at different line um, 
the same calcite layer from a point located at the top and three or a point located at the base A3 where the inclination of the calcite layer is different, you have almost five degrees um, of difference in the magnetic inclination, which is quite significant. So what we did here, we did not have the horizontal layer in this stalagmite, but what we did is to calculate the mean slope based on this trend line for each line. And we apply this slope to all the data set here in B, and we interpolated the data to a deep calcite of zero, this means for horizontal layer, to obtain the hypothetical values of magnetic inclination for horizontal layer. And after doing this, we can see that now the data fit quite well with the model. Okay, also we, uh, they are a little bit shallower, a, bit, a little bit lower, but still included in the uh, confidence interval of, of the model. So we try to investigate this effect by using anisotropy. And here, this is data of anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility. And um, previous studies show that um, natural and scientific uh, calcite, um, the fabric is, is dominantly oblate. And in the case of speleothema with few or no the triple component, uh, the K3 is perpendicular to the surface uh, of the speleothema and, and corresponds to the direction of <coughs> the crystallographic axis of the calcite crystal. This is well illustrated here with a very strong correlation between the K, the orientation of the K3 with the deep of the calcite layer. Now, if, if we want to look at, so, so in this case, the, the fabric, the AMS fabric is dominantly uh, carried by calcite. Now, if we want to look at the ferromagnetic mineral, we have to use an anisotropy of anisteretic remanent magnetization. And although the correlation is low, moderate, we can see here a trend and a correlation between the K1 and the deep of the calcite layer. Um, when, when you have paramagnetic or ferromagnetic minerals, the fabric is, is usually prolate and perpendicular, perpendicular to, the, to the surface, to the stratification plane. Um, so what we can verify here is um, uh, when, when uh, uh, while the K1 of the A of the, of the ferromagnetic fabric decreases uh, concomitantly with the decrease of the magnetic inclination, uh, this indicates that indeed magnetic mineral are our role during the transportation along the stalamite or um, just mimic the shape of the stalagmite. And this leads to a change and, and, and depositional error in the inclination, the magnetic inclination, depending if you are on the top or on the border. So we try also to, to check this effect. Um, this is not yet published data, but this is a work uh, currently conducted by Elisa Sanchez Moreno for the University of Burgos in Spain with a stalagmite from the Luger dos Morcegos cave in Portugal. And if we look at the horizontal layer in the central growing axis, we can see that for clean layer, dominantly calcite, the fabric is oblate and K3 is perpendicular to the uh, stratification plane. Now looking at more dirty, and more dirty in the sense that uh, they contain more clay and, and detrital fraction, and thus more ferromagnetic mineral, the fabric is prolate and K1 is perpendicular to the stratification plane. Now, if you look at all the data, you got mixture of fabric and intermediary fabric, um, depending on the relative uh, contribution of ferromagnetic mineral versus calcite. So this is, this is in agreement with some author previous report when observing that um, the IMS fabric can change uh, from a, a oblate to prolate, depending on ferromagnetic or paramagnetic mineral are uh, admixed, uh, and if they overcome the signal, overcome the negative susceptibility of calcite. Okay, so uh, now looking at oh, this is yeah, this is the uh, anisotropy of anisotropy of anisotropy remanent magnetization. 
And as in the case of the ponds, uh, the, the stalagmite studded by a pond, the fabric is prolate and the K1 is perpendicular to the uh, stratification plate. Now, if you look at the inclined, inclined layers, layer A, B, C, these are the data of anisotropy. And we can see that there is a gradual uh, change in the orientation of K1 in the ASM or ARM. Um, and this is actually the orientation of K1 in this case varies in function of the deep of the castle layer. So this, this is, these are really exciting data because you, we can see that the, the K1 almost mimics the shape of the stalagmite. This is almost a perfect uh, uh, fit between, between the shape and, and the orientation of the K1 of, of the fabrics. And of course, if you look at magnetic inclination, it varies also accordingly. So this confirms that uh, depositional inclination error actually exists. Uh, and this means that for people who want to study speleothem in the future, uh, we uh, always have to focus on horizontal layers, essentially. But this leads to problem number two, which is sampling, because sampling is challenging. Uh, you need bravery and not to be claustrophobic. <laughs> you also need a little bit of inventiveness to orientate your stalagmite. Um, but with time, we, we, this is the most suitable technique we, we, we find by marking the north with a magnetic compass at the, at the top of the stalagmite and then using a rubber bands and, and, a, and a matter of sewing and the leveler, uh, we report the uh, mark of the magnetic north on the border. And then cutting in the lab. Cutting in the lab is probably the most tricky step. It's like opening a kinder eggs because you never know what you will get inside just before to cut. And you can have some surprise, actually. So if you are lucky and get this kind of, of spelotem where you have a nice uh, horizontal layer along the same drawing axis, some of them may actually um, have displaced growing axis. So the, the growing axis is not necessarily at the same place. So you have to play with several slides to be sure to have the horizontal layer. This is even more evident here in this small one, when the drip water displays on the left, and then you have to sample two different slides. And if you have to this, the 3D perspective, this is even more complicated because for example, in this case, it's okay. You have a horizontal layer on the front side and on the, on the lateral. But if you look here, you will see that you will have a big problem because your, your sample will not only include this layer, but will include more youngest, youngest layer here and strongly and steep layer. So this is definitely not suitable. Another problem is uh, uh, the, the central um, axis dissolution. This is a common feature in Spelelton, where you can have axial hole due to low calcite deposition or post-depositional dissolution. And if you look at these blocks, you can see nice, uh, nice calcite linear, but if you go deeper, and you will see that it's a mess because you have this dissolution axis with probably secondary calcite. And so the orientation of the magnetic mineral are not anymore the same as the original uh, calcite layer you want to study. So my tip is to cut spelotem like you peel an artichoke by doing several sides, step by step, slice by slice until you reach some, the, the less disturbed part. And by doing this, you will also have several slices that you can use for this different analysis, isotope, isopene, s dating, and p -max. Uh, Problem number three is um, the antagonism between dirty and, and clean stalagmite. Dirty in the sense that they contain a, a, a high concentration of detrital mineral. So this kind of stalagmite uh, are really good for, for paleomite because you can see really high magnetization, really nice uh, vectors. But 
they are a nightmare for diving because they contain a lot of detritorium, which is a contamination for, <clears throat> for UTH diving. On the other hand, clean stalagmites are very good for, for dating, for radioisotopic dating, but you can have some surprise due to really low magnetic content and have this, uh, this really bad magnetic results. So a perspective is, uh, we developed an approach recently, uh, this is a paper under review by Elisa Sanchez Moreno, where we try to date spelloting uh, using paleomagnetic data. So we studied uh, stalagmite from uh, Soprador do Carvalho in the central region of Portugal. We dated by using UTH and C14 and provide the following H model. Uh, we conjugate alternative field demagnetization and thermal demagnetization and obtain stable, well defined, and well crusted uh, characteristic remanent magnetization direction. So this is an H model based on radioisotopic data. And the idea is to look and to search for the best fit between our paleomagnetic data here in black and gray with a, a known uh, paleosecular variation model. In this case, this is a Shadif model. So we use the archaeodating MATLAB 2 uh, by Pavan Carrasco et al. 2011. And actually, he, 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 the, the software is looking for the, the best fit between the data of each sample and uh, the reference curve, and then calculate the age. And by doing this, we obtain the following age model. Uh, when we compare this model with uh, uh, radioisotopic data, we can show that it's, it's quite similar. It fits quite well. Also, the paleomagnetic uh, model has a higher resolution due to higher number of data points, but the mean uh, age are more or less in the same error margin and, and quite comparable. We also try to do this with uh, the PFM9K model from Nielsen Tal, and we obtain similar results also with some differences, but still in the confidence interval. Um, we also test the same approach in the stalagmite studied by Port, and uh, we also see that there is a, a, a comparable age model that shares the same, the same confidence interval. So this provides a new approach to date stalagmite using paleomagnetic data. Uh, of course, it has some drawbacks because anyway, you need at least an idea of the age of the stalagmite to choose the time window you will, you will select it for, for the model. And this can only date young speleotem back to the last 14,000 years because these are the limit of the available uh, paleosecular uh, variation model available in the literature. Uh, so to finish, I will present some preliminary data of a project called SAMEPA project founded by Foundation of Science and Technology. Um, and also two collaborative uh, projects between Portugal and MIT in USA. Uh, this is uh, uh, the same the same stalagmite studied by Elisa, the ALM1. Uh, these are the preliminary, pre preliminary uh, magnetic data where we can show a really nice geomagnetic excursion. And uh, this geomagnetic excursion is also recorded in a twin stalagmite located just beside ALM1 and has the same pattern, with, which is gradual on the base and then abruptly come back to normal, to normal polarity at the top. This is a screen microscopy analysis conducted by Eduardo Lima from MIT um, from a slice uh, cut by a diamond wire saw. And here is uh, uh, the representation of the natural remaining magnetization after removal uh, viscous overprint. And we can see area with high um, uh, rich magnetic mineral, all that contain strong magnetic records. We also conduct fork, uh, fork diagram in all along the stalagmite. And it seems that the, the, there is a stable grain size distribution and composition of the magnetic mineral throughout the entire stalagmite, which is uh, dominantly carried by single domain and, and vortex state drains. 
And this is uh, to finish. I don't know uh, the time. I hope I, I, I have not exceeded the time. But this is um, uh, another experiment, which is uh, done also by uh, Anna Hartel Brass in the frame of his master, master thesis. Um, the question is whether we can find any indicator of the detrital input in, in stalagmite. I mean, how dirty, how dirty a stalagmite is? Because usually you can conduct uh, X-ray diffraction, but X-ray diffraction in, in stalagmite is tricky because you have more than 90, 95% of calcite, and so the calcite peak dominates most of the signal. Uh, if you want to do ICPMES, it's a little bit complicated because you have to dissolve all the calcite. Um, so we try to use mercury. Why mercury? Because mercury is, is normally carried by organic matter and clay. And so it can provide an indicator of, uh, of detrital content. And here we can see a nice correlation between the intensity of the natural remanent magnetization which in part is controlled by the concentration of magnetic mineral and the content is in, in mercury. Okay, uh, so some conclusion and perspective. So yes, we can say that Spelotem can be considered an uh, excellent uh, recorder of the Earth's magnetic field and climate, but with some cautions, uh, which is that depositional inclination error may exist and uh, more investigation is, is surely needed to understand how, how this work and how we can be able to correct this effect. Um, for people who want to study Spenotem, uh, horizontal layer are the key. Uh, so think twice before cutting your stalagmite. Uh, dirty versus clean Spenotem, this is a compromise you have to do. <clears throat> And uh, well, not everything is uh, perfect. Uh, studying spelotem, uh, magnetism spelotem is not straightforward. You need braver, perseverance, and you need luck uh, to get nice, nice, nice sugar. Thank you very much uh, for, for uh, looking at this presentation. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, very nice presentation. Thanks. Uh, let's give Eric a big round of applause. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if there is uh, some question, please ask it away or use the chat to do so. Um, no question, please. Yes, no, there is a question. Yeah. Okay. Maybe they are typing it. Uh, ah, Jose. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Joseph. <laughs> you can unmute yourself if you want. All right. Okay, that's easier. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh yeah, quit typing then. Well, hi Eric. Uh, nice, nice talk, nice lecture. And um, well, we had an opportunity to talk a lot <laughs> about all this just recently. It was a pleasure having you in our lab. Um I already asked you a little bit of this, but you know, if you had to define what kind of magnetization we're measuring in flow stones, you know, following the conventional standard classification <laughs> of stable magnetization, what what would you say? What it's a mix? If so, what percentage of the trital po uh, versus post the trital versus chemical? I mean, express a little bit your feelings, your thoughts about the nature of the magnetization in the speleothemes, at least the ones that you've measured. What you said. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I thank you, Joseph. Yeah, we already uh, uh, discussed about this. And yeah, in, in Flowstone, I, 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 I do not really know about flowstone. There is some paper of flowstone. I think it's Zanella, Zanella and colleague from Italia studied flowstones. And my problem I would have with flowstone is if 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 really the fabric of the magnetic mineral um, mimics the shape of the stalagmite, and, and if the, the, the magnetization is detrital, um, this means that we probably we have also some uh, inclination. Um, uh, effect 
on flowstone because because actually it's a slope. So when when the magnetic mineral are, are transported by the water along along an, an inclined uh, layer, so probably you will have some some effect. Um, but this is something that is that has never been studied. And and I mean you you got a lot of flowstone there and. And you will probably uh, be able to look at this deeper. And, and now about your, your other question. Um, well, th this is a good question because actually this is something I'm, I'm wondering is uh, many in most of the, of the speleotem and the data published uh, suggests that it is uh, a detrital magnetization. Uh, can we have really a chemical magnetization? This is a question because um, I, I'm not sure this has, this has been yet reported in, in, in the literature. Um, but in this case, we, we have to create new minerals. And my, my problem is that cave conditions are quite stable, are very stable. Temperature is very stable. Um, Redox conditions are stable in the absence of microbes. Uh, so yes, maybe we can have some chemical magnetization due to, uh, okay, new, mini new magnetic minerals are created and when they reach the blocking volume, okay, they'll require a secondary magnetization. Um, but, uh, but yeah, how how you create it, this this secondary? Uh, so a, a, a key is maybe microbes because um, microbe can be trapped within the porosity of some stalagmite, and there are micro who have some affinity with iron, and that can dissolve magnetite and create new condition and change the redox condition. So in this case, maybe they can be. Uh, the, the agent to 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 create a, a secondary magnetization, but I, I don't know all of the paper. I, I know quite a lot of it, of, of it but I, I, I do not remember any paper demonstrating a chemical magnetization in in, in stalagmite. And so either it does not exist, or simply that um, it's rare, or people did not yet publish it. But 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 yeah, um, for me it's everything is that we told until now and no chemical magnetization. All right, thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to get back soon to your wonderful lab and wonderful city. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat from Jabulu. Um, Nice talk. I'm curious that uh, whether the relation between sampling position and inclination shallowing could give some information about the recording mechanism of NRM in stalagmite. Let me see if I understand the question. I'm not sure to understand uh, where I can see the chat. Okay. Let me open the chat. Uh, well, but th this actually, this actually what what I try to to show is um, so so we see that the fabric of ferromagnetic mineral is prolate, and in the data I show you see that the the K one of of the fabric of anisteritic remanent magnetization is almost always perpendicular to the surface. So this means probably that it's a detritory magnetization, okay? Because if it was a secondary chemical, you, you would not expect necessarily that the magnetic, the shape of the magnetic mineral mimics the shape of the stalagmite, okay? Uh, if they grew after the depositions on the calcite, they should not have this preferential orientation and probably have, I don't know, a same K1 direction. But okay, the fact that the K1 of the anisteretic 
of the anisotropy of anesthetic remanence magnetization uh, mimic and follow the, the deep of the calcite, or I mean the shape of the stalagmite, mean that the magnetization is uh, detrital. This is a sum of the magnetic moment of the volume. So this is a sum of, of, of the orientation of the different magnetic particle. Okay. And so I think this is a proof that it's a detrital remanent magnetization. Okay. I, I don't know if I answer answer to your question, but but yeah. Okay, okay, Javo. Thank yes. you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is any other question? There is no other question that we can give Eric another big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm gonna share the screen for for uh, the closing uh, statements. Uh, we are currently in the EU Eastern uh, Hemisphere time slot. After August, we are going to go back to EU Western Hemisphere time slot. We're going to take some break for meetings happening during summer or winter, during August. I mean. And on the 24th of August, we are going to have uh, Jang Yang Lee from Curry University in Australia and, uh, and then move back. So um, stay tuned on our mailing list. And also, please like and watch previous uh, talks and including this one uh, on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for for coming and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Les, you can stop the recording now. <laughs> <laughs>